education itself is never going to move. It's always the same. Like, well, we want to know the, what we call the truth about things. And, and that's always been, been the challenge. Uh, the technology in education, like how we teach it, how we deliver it, I, I think that's constantly changing. One of the things I love to do is ask students how are they using the technology. So show me what you can do with this. Oh, I love this Snapchat. Okay, so how are you going to use that in your teaching or your thinking? Or how will that help your students learn? Well, my reluctant students are interested to get things visually. So I can take a photograph of something we're doing and they've got that image and they can work from the image. Okay, that's interesting. Can you say more about that? So I've tr stopped trying to keep up. I've still worked on keeping interested. So I'd rather keep interested than keep up. I don't get nervous anymore if I don't know how to say, I can't, this isn't, can someone help me? And they do. And so then to make it as seamless as possible, it also, other people get noted for their skills and abilities in a different kind of technology. Other people become aware of different technologies and then an equilibrating of locuses of knowledge and control or technical abilities then to bring to bear on what the central question is. So I'm not that interested in the technology, I'm interested in what it will do with the thinking and the problem solving. In certain ways it will change, it has changed and it will continue to change. But I'm not a wholehearted believer in, in technology radically changing teaching. I think that the important thing is the human interaction and the conversation in teaching. So every time I stand up in front of people, whether I talk to a naturalist group um, at a professional conference or in front of a classroom of people, it's all teaching as far as I'm concerned because it's all communicating what you know, why you love it, what's interesting about it. And so a lot of that you don't need any technology for. But, of course, the technology did change over time. So I started with blackboard and white chalk. Big excitement if I got colored chalk because, you know, then you could maybe di do a diagram where you highlighted certain things. And then we went to whiteboards and the multiple colors you can use there. And, of course, the big transition was when, when things like PowerPoint came into play. But I think they need to be used very selectively. Technology has influenced some things but I consider new technology to be the 1905 violin I play instead of the 1743 one. Um, so some things don't change. In terms of music theory, we, there are all sorts of notation programs and things to help. Uh, in fact, they slow down the process until recently, they've actually slowed down the process and hand manuscripting was much more efficient and effective. Things are changing, but technology is not necessarily always an aid to improving the, the teaching or the learning aspects. I'm needing to be more mindful about how much and how I use, and it, we say technology as though it's all the same. I mean, there's, there's always been technology, I guess, since the wheel or before. But um, if technology is a tool that helps me be a better human being, I'm interested. If it helps my students learn something deep that matters to them, I'm interested and curious about how it works and what it does, but I don't want it to become the, top, the topic of whatever we're studying. The very first course I taught was uh, the programming language BASIC on mainframe. Um, and Everything in those days was text-based, so there was no graphical user interface. There were, basically, no one had a, a, a PC at home. It was, it was quite a different world. Then, of course, computers came along, and that was a whole new adventure, getting uh, how to integrate the computers into the curriculum. And, of course, the computers in those days when you look back, <laughs> pretty primitive sorts of beasts. <laughs> so the world as we have it now is extremely different. Uh, you know, we have, everyone has a laptop and a tablet and a mobile device of some sort. Uh, so, so the world, uh, the world, not just the university, but the entire world is, is, is quite a different uh, beast than it was in those days. Late 80s, beginning of the 90s, when I moved into administration, that was about the point where technology suddenly began to have 
a fairly significant impact. And at that time, there were lots of talks about people, everybody having a computer and all that kind of thing. Computing centers are, well, just trying to get them established in those days. I remember we spent quite a bit of time talking to IBM and various suppliers and finally ended up with a digital network. And this is about the time that networking started. We had email just beginning at that point and so on. And the, the internet as we knew it hadn't quite developed. There were, there were primitive tools there, but we didn't have the web. We didn't have web browsers and stuff. But there was definitely a network and there was going to be, it, it was pretty clear to anybody who looked at it that the way that we got out information was about to change quite dramatically. And in the old days, the university considered forcing all students to, uh, to have a laptop when they came into the university, and that was too radical. Uh, it just, it was a policy that, that just didn't go anywhere. Now, uh, I don't know any student that doesn't have a laptop and a tablet and a smartphone of some sort. So, so uh, things have changed. Our shorthand for role was, Somebody who's sitting at any desk in this university will have the same access to information as somebody who's sitting in the University of Toronto Library in downtown Toronto. So that was the objective. And when we came up with the networking thing, we decided to make the network within the university the same as the internet. It wasn't called that at the time, but the whole idea was that we would run the internal networks exactly the same way the other ones were, so there was no kind of hidden interfaces. And people, once they learned how to use it, could do anything. It used to be, as a researcher, if I needed an article, almost surely our library didn't have the journal. Um, journals were expensive, and I work in a very esoteric uh, area. So I would have to go to Calgary, or I'd have to do it via interlibrary loan. And now everything's available. I felt isolated here in the, in the early days because I couldn't get the articles I needed. We didn't really have the equipment. We didn't have really the, the internet, uh, the access. But now I don't feel uh, isolated at all. I feel anything I need, I can, I can get. Where it's truly helped is in research for some of the histor historical courses. I can remember spending six months combing through uh, the, the archives at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris to find three or four beautiful gems of, of, of information that I, I could then bring back and incorporate to what, into, my, into my work. And now students can do the same search in 0.03 seconds and find many, many more times the amount of information. Where, where the problem lies is you still have to call through all of that information. I think it can be a real benefit for the instructor, the teacher, because you can go out and, and check things online uh, and can be a benefit for the students. But there are dangers. As I usually would tell my students, any idiot can put stuff on the internet, and many do. So check your sources, because there's a lot of garbage out there. With the explosion on the internet, um, students are, uh, are uh, quite skilled in accessing all kinds of resources. Um, and they do bring them into the discussion. My job then is to ask them to critically look at those resources and see whether or not it's evidence-informed information because that's what I want them to bring back, not uh, uh, different kinds of things that, that uh, really uh, you, you have to question the, the validity of what is being discussed. But absolutely, they engage in all kinds of um, searches. And sometimes I, I sort of go, where did you find this? I wish I could be as, as internet savvy and tech savvy as my students are um, and as my own children are. Um, I'm just not. Um, they're so far ahead. They, can, they are so resourceful. Um, so I think that it has um, allowed for a different kind of engagement. I think it's not used particularly skillfully in a lot of ways. Um, I think people, particularly in the education field, are very gung-ho to go ahead with it. On the other hand, it's, uh, FaceTime has allowed me to talk to my graduate students at some distance over time for not very much. So we can explore an idea for an hour on FaceTime on my iPhone. 
in a way that I couldn't otherwise do. So technology allows some fractal learning, I would say, but in between other things that we're doing, you can pick up all kinds of things. So partly technology has required, I think, a good teacher to pay more attention to the central scaffolding of cognition. So where am I going to hang these bits of information and technobytes that I have in terms of information on technology? Um, how can I use technology to communicate what I've learned? Students can be from different provinces on online courses, which is exciting, especially if it's an elective. I teach an elective on, on rural health. Um, I've had students from three different provinces on there. It's great because people's perspectives are really interesting about how they view things. And there's ways of having them introduce each other online, get to know one another. There's ways of doing different kind of activities so that it's like they're in a classroom, but they're not. And those, I think, are really exciting. I teach a public health ethics course, and it, it is completely online. And initially, the very first question that I ask them uh, is, what are your expectations regarding this course? What concerns do you have with using Moodle? It's just trying to um, modify what I'm doing and being cognizant that this is online. I, I am using technology, but not allowing technology to be a barrier to their learning. If you've got an online course, you, you have to have very clear guidelines that the students know what the expectations are. And, um, uh, and so there is a lot of engagement um, with, b between students. And in fact, I pull back because I don't want them to discuss with me. I don't want a two-way conversation. I want a community discussion. Having face-to-face, -face, being in class, having first, you know, first uh, had knowledge about your students and so on, getting to really know the students, say, is one way and a very effective way about teaching. But when we, when we use nothing but tech, okay, there is room for tech. I'm not saying do away with it. There is room for it. But when we totally rely on it, that type of, you know, student engagement does not occur. And I can go online. I can watch somebody teaching quantum mechanics for MIT. What's amazing is, He's doing it pretty much the way I did it 50 years ago. <laughs> um, you know, it's not all that gripping. I think when you go into a classroom and you have real people there and you have the interactions, that's where the motivation comes from. As uh, an instructor, I need to be cognizant that uh, students have different learning modalities and um, have different ways of, uh, of, of learning, preferences, um, and I cannot approach technology as a, a one-size-fits-all. So that, to me, is the onus on me, even though I do use Moodle and use a fair number of different technologies. I think that's the greatest change from a practical perspective, right? Because, as I said, we started with overhead. Power, you know, overheads, and now we went into PowerPoints, and now it's all this Moodle and that. So, uh, learning about that technology and feeling comfortable with it and addressing that um, has been has been a really interesting challenge, but it's still been a challenge. Certainly, the context has changed to to a certain degree, um, uh, but the principles are still very similar. So, even though I can't talk about the the latest. Um, IV machinery, I can't, I can't even tell you what the names of them are anymore. I can talk about the principles of IV therapy, and that has not changed over 33 years that I've been uh, a registered nurse. So that's where I have to go while they can give me some of the more uh, detailed experiences. And so then I get them to unpack some of those detailed experiences to broaden that out a little wee bit and we have that kind of discussion. Well, I talked about technology. It both helps and hinders. Um, I think things like PowerPoint uh, 
for the most part, is a disaster because students feel that they don't have to pay attention and then they badger you to post all your PowerPoint slides online, right? And it isn't just the content. When you rely too much on technology, you're relying a great deal on content. And yet, when you rely a little bit on technology, and then you try to open up discussions in the classroom r relative to what you're trying to present, I think you get a much better learning experience. One of the big changes for me personally was I didn't used to post my, my lecture notes on, on uh, I didn't make them available because I think that I like students to come to class, first of all, and I find when I did uh, make my, my lecture notes available, it seemed to cut into the number, the enrollment in, in, uh, in a particular lecture. I feel that students learn by writing things down, uh, and, and so I was, I was kind of reluctant to post my, my lecture notes on the, on the internet. Uh, but now it's expected. I mean, everybody does it. They, they insist. I, I took a lot of flack for, for not having uh, my, my notes on the internet. A, a major change I found is how many laptops there are in classrooms now. And I'm not convinced that this is the great thing. I, I'm torn. For my personal use, when I'm trying to take notes in a classroom setting, I need to be writing on paper. And so when I go to a public lecture, I'm writing on paper. And this thing with the act of writing on paper that helps me make sense of the material in a different way. And I try to tell my students, well, you know, if you can, you're better off taking notes. I don't want to be hard line and say no laptops, right? There's, you know, people have different learning needs, right? Everybody's different. But my gut feeling is that the dying art of handwritten note taking is actually detrimental, right? I think that there's something about having to write it down that's making you have to understand that material in a way that's very, very different than just transcription. Right? And I think, I think that's a change where the technology hasn't always been for the best. On the other hand, though, if I get stuck on a fact in class and I see all the laptops open, I can yell out and sort of crowdsource answers, right? or I can get people working on, on things in different ways that way. If I think the lecture is going in an odd direction, getting somebody to look up something on a laptop is always a good way to take things in a new direction and inject something new without me having to stop there and, and sort of flounder. So, so there are benefits. You know, today, uh, most students have technology in the classroom, whether it's their phones or they bring their laptops, things like that. Some people, I think, uh, worry that what's happening with those uh, young people in the back when they have their laptops open is they're watching Netflix movies or whatever like that. You know, I don't think it's the student's issue. I think it's actually the instructor's issue if that's actually happening. If I'm not engaging those students so that they you know, find value in actually listening to me, well then I'm probably not doing my job. I need to maybe then sit back and say, okay, why is it we're uh, engaging them? And generally I, I find they don't use their, fortunately, you know, they don't have their computers open that often. That uh, They're generally listening to you. I'm trying to make it. Uh, I'm giving them a problem that we, you know, uh, as they haven't seen, I haven't seen, you know, just right up on the board, and we're working on that. And uh, so I'm hoping the ones at the very back, I'm not too sure, but uh, in the first half of the class, they're, they're participating, and and I, I think it's uh, very important. I get a lot of questions, you know, I, I get a lot of emails a day, which I like, you know, I like to correspond with the students. It's, no, that is amazing. The emails, it's. Uh, so we can get them any time in the morning, <laughs> three o'clock in the morning. Or, uh, no, no, I, uh, I think that has really helped uh, education, emails. Uh, and of course, you know, people, uh, Wikipedia and just looking it up. Uh, if they can't do a problem, usually they can look it up online and, and the keen ones do, you know, and uh, they say, how's this solution? And uh, so, no, no, that's, that's, I, I think that has changed. That, that has made it. I wish it had been available when I was a student. Well, now, um, I do have uh, students who are in practicums, and um, now they text message me when they have questions, um, and I text message them back. Uh, it's the same thing with their preceptors, so the nurses that they are uh, buddied with for the, their last clinical practicum, preceptors will text message me. So that's really a very different kind of um, relationship and connectivity to both the students and the preceptors. Uh, certainly email is still popular, but using Moodle as well. Um, I tend to use Moodle quite extensively, and I ask students to submit uh, all of their assignments. I communicate with them through Moodle frequently. Uh, so that has changed. 
Technology also, I think, um, has had an impact on the way I lecture and the way students learn. So um, oftentimes, if I'm talking about a concept, um, what I can do then is I can maybe bring up uh, a video uh, or I can actually uh, s set them to go towards a, a website that actually shows then how this concept or knowledge is actually seen kind of in the real world and how it's applied uh, by business people. So helping students to take a concept and think how it can be represented differently is fascinating. But faster is not better. Uh, so there still has to be that thinking and discernment about not being driven by the technology, but what are the other ways in which technology can help me think better? Um, how can I communicate more effectively with the technology? How does the nature of the technology itself, even the hardware, change how I think about thinking? So I think all of this technology is wonderful, but just because it exists doesn't mean it's the right thing to use and it doesn't mean it's always used wisely. So I think, you know, certainly people need to think about what, what is the real value of this particular tool in teaching. I've started in the last few years to think in a way of teaching as, as a kind of curating almost. because there is way more available now and more readily available. And anybody could go out and find it. So in a way, what profs do is they sift through all that stuff out there on the web and they pick important ideas or illuminating things and they juxtapose them, right? So let's read this, but now let's read this and think about it in conjunction. It's a kind of curating of an experience. And I think that's what we offer beyond just technology. But I still think there's, there's something more. And it, it's, it, it's hard to explain, I guess, but it's that human interaction of minds because I think most people are lazy and they'll read something but they won't think deeply about it. And that's what we need to focus on more. Um, I heard someone recently, a colleague, say he'd heard from somewhere that nothing should be on a test that you could look up on Google. And I make that point sometimes in, in talks about liberal education. It's not about facts, right? It's about thinking. The facts are either going to be obsolete in a few years anyway, so why memorize them? And if they are going to stick around, they're on Google and you can find them in 30 seconds. So it's more about pushing people to think, to learn how to think and to question the world around them.